Hello, Marcia Kavanaugh. Thanks so much for joining us. Results in the Orleans sheriff's race were more than just about a person. They could indicate a shift in the nationwide judicial system. We'll examine that campaign as well as other key elections. We'll also discuss the latest COVID vaccine mandates. There was an arrest of a former Jesuit now heading a charity under suspicion of sex crimes. And our Future Watch segment reports on local retailers' expectations for holiday shopping. Joining us are tonight's informed sources, Errol Laborde producer of Informed Sources, Clancy Dubos, politics columnist, Gambit Newspaper, Don Ostrom, Channel 12's Future Watch reporter, and Mike Perlstein, investigative reporter, WWL-TV Channel 4. Let's go on over to Errol for the latest COVID news and some changes in Orleans. Well, the mayor mandated that the uh, um, new regulations beginning uh, January 3rd mm -hmm. for kids, uh, uh, kids age 5 to 11, uh, will be needed to get the COVID vaccine. By January 3rd, they need to at least, between January 3rd and February 1st, they need to have at least one. And then by February 1st, they need to uh, go for the second. That would be, February 1st would be a month before Mardi Gras. And so I think they're sort of eyeing that too, to be sure that there's not part of that problem. The school system also said that it, it, it wants, uh, uh, beginning on January 3rd, that uh, everyone um, five years and all students and so even beyond the uh, 11 years old. Uh, this, uh, according to The Advocate, uh, makes New Orleans the city that has the, uh, the youngest vaccination rate uh, uh, at, at five, and no one else has it that young, even though a lot of the cities have various combinations. And so uh, it's a big step for, uh, uh, for the city of New Orleans. The mayor also said that in um, February 15th, which will be right around the time when the, uh, when the parade starts, that they're going to look and see about the possibility of needing to extend the, the uh, public masking mandate again mm -hmm. and bringing it back, depending on how things look on all of these records. And there's been a lot of testing going on. One big test is what happened with the, the crew of Boo, and apparently uh, the crew of Boo did okay. Another piece of COVID-related news that happened today was that um, Sean Payton will be out of the game um, Sunday night against the Buccaneers because he has COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, this will be his... Uh, his second time, and um, of all the teams, uh, 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 Tampa Bay, and to be playing them in um, in Tampa Bay. So Dennis Allen, who's the defensive quarter, uh, coordinator, will be leading the team. And this will be the second time that that Peyton has been out, has missed the game because of a health related issue. One time he had a uh, a leg that was uh, um, broken, and he was out for and he was out for a game, and so he'll be out of it this week. And so as far as the city and, and uh, what the mayor announced regarding kids between 5 and 11, that is in order to go into restaurants and businesses, right? You have to prove vaccination now for Absolutely, kids 5 and yeah. above um, or, um, or a test, a negative test. Absolutely, yes. So, so that's what that applies to. Yeah, um, right. Okay, and that wouldn't take effect until after the holidays. Right. Okay. So the city's now, the health um, officials now are preparing for the, the new va variant, the Omicron variant. Um, so what are, what are they expecting? Are they really, you know, concerned about this? You know, it seems like no one knows for sure. Uh, what we seem to know is that it's very, very contagious. What we don't know is just quite how severe it is. And mm -hmm. so that still needs to, uh, uh, to be found out. Okay. All right. We'll see. Uh, everybody still needs to take precautions. Okay, Clancy, I'm going to go over to you now because we had a big race for Orleans Parish Sheriff's and runoff determined and, and a winner. There's a new sheriff in town. Yes, that's the headline everybody's going with, as cliche as it is. Yep. This new sheriff is different from every other new sheriff. For the first time in New Orleans history, we have a black female elected sheriff, and she's the first black female elected sheriff in Louisiana history as well. Louisiana has had a few women sheriffs, but never a black woman sheriff. And as you can see on the graphic here, Susan Hudson, the former independent police monitor, won with more than 53 percent of the vote. Now keep this figure up there, because I want to talk about those numbers. In the primary, Gusman got 8,000 more votes than he got in the runoff. He got close to 36,000 in the in the, um, in the primary, and he got just under 28,000 hmm. in in the runoff. That's down 8,000 uh, votes. Hudson. Uh, her, she increased her primary vote totals just in raw numbers 
by about 5,000. She, here she's getting almost 32,000. She got almost 37,000. I'm sorry, she, she, she got uh, less than almost 27,000 in the primary. So she increased her take by uh, 5,000 votes. Gusman went down 8,000 votes, and it was a much lower turnout. In the primary, we had a 28 percent turnout. In the runoff, we had just over 22 percent. Mm -hmm. So a, a small turnout of voters citywide really helps progressive candidates. Uh, progressives are not the majority in New Orleans, but certainly people who are slightly left of center are a majority. Gusman has always been, uh, has always run very well among black voters, especially older black voters. And in fact, if you could see the results from the early voting, Gusman actually got 53 percent of the early votes cast. That is primarily super chronic voters, especially older African American voters. That's Gusman's base. So on election day, he actually got beat worse than, hmm. than a, a 53 to 47 percent. He probably lost 55 percent to 45 percent. On, on election day. And this was surprising to, to many, maybe not to candidate Hudson, but it was surprising to many. It was surprising to a lot of people, although I will say the people that I was speaking to in the closing days in Gusman's campaign, they were all worried. They sounded worried. They admitted they were worried. They privately told me that Gusman was worried, and, and Hudson was feeling pretty good. I mean, you never know until the votes are cast, and when the turnout is so small, only 22.4%, it really is a question not just at that point of mm -hmm. how many are voting, but who is Who's voting. Right. right. And so she did a great job in mobilizing her supporters and getting them out, out to the polls. So um, tell us a little bit more about her. And well, obviously there are community about, members that really were aware right. of her. Well, let me say one thing about mobilizing voters. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, she, she had support from a lot of outside forces, let's say, some, some local but mostly national proponents of criminal justice reform, and they poured in about a million and a half dollars into this race, probably more than a million in the runoff. So that mo you can mobilize a lot of people with a million dollars in a small turnout election. And they actually hired some people to do uh, get out the vote stuff using this little document here, this, mm -hmm. little, this little machine here, a yeah. cell phone. Uh, they did it very well on social media, and they identified their vote. They reminded them to get out. And that's more and more what it takes to get people out these days. And in terms of who is Susan Hudson, the, the former independent police monitor doesn't come to jails brand new. She actually was a, a police monitor in Los Angeles, which the police department there does run a jail, not quite the way we do it. But they have to keep, keep people in custody and uh, maintain care, custody, and control of them. So she's not totally new to the idea of uh, taking care of and keeping people who need to be in jail in jail. Uh, she uh, is part of the progressive movement, but she also maintains quite a lot of contact with the community. As police monitor, she interacted a lot with people who had complaints about NOPD and, and in groups as well. When, when it, she felt that the uh, police department was not communicating very well or there was some gap between where the cops were and where the community was, she felt that it was her job and her office's job to fill in that gap. So she uh, had done a lot of work out there in the vineyards of, of contacting the community and building relationships and establishing roots in the city uh, because she's not from here, but she's been here for well over a decade now, and this is her home. So it's going to be interesting to see how she does when she t actually takes over the jail, and she's going to do things like uh, not charge prisoners for use of the phones, which is actually a, a big burden on the families of the, of the people in jail, but it also is a big revenue generator for the jail. And she's going to change things in the commissary and, you know, do a lot of the progressive things that she promised. And, and in an exclusive interview that we did at Gambit, her, her main takeaway was, I'm going to keep my promises. So we'll see how that plays out and what impact it has on the city's crime rate in so, the years to come. So if that's a big revenue generated for the jail, the phone calls, how do you replace that revenue? Has well, she she's going to do an audit, a, a head-to-toe audit of the sheriff's office and find out who's got contracts, how many take-home cars there are, and <coughs> where the money's going. Uh, and she's right when she says that if you've been watching the, the sheriff's office interact, the sheriff in particular, not just Marlon Gusman, but his predecessor, the big bone of contention uh, with the sheriff's office has been the money. It's public money. And if you watch the, the uh, council budget hearings every fall, when the sheriff goes there, 
Uh, I remember when Charlie Foti was there, he, he'd give him his, his numbers on the back of an envelope mm -hmm. almost. This, is, this was, my numbers on the election returns are, are, are a lot more than what Foti used to show the council members. So the council has always been frustrated about getting information, financial information, out of the sheriff's office. She's going to go in there, she says, and do an, an independent audit and find out where the money's going, okay. and she's going to look for some savings there. Okay, another issue that they differed on, of course, was that uh, additional building for the jail for mental health phase services. Three. Yeah, That's yeah right. phase three. So uh, let's bring Mike into this conversation right now. And, you know, we've been throwing this word progressive around. Um, and this is, you know, we've had candidates here considered progressives in criminal justice reform. Um, we've seen it here in our area, but also throughout the country. So how does what we are seeing develop here sort of play into a national movement? Well, New Orleans is, is different. We're not swept up in some of the, I guess, what would be considered you know, the progressive policies that have actually been, you know, weaponized by opponents, uh, things like defund the police. There's no defund the police here in New Orleans. We want to fund the police more. And, uh, but what Clancy didn't point out is the negatives on Gusman. Of course, you know, that jail is still under a consent decree. He essentially lost control of running the jail for most of the past eight years. Um, you know, those are, are big negatives. There have been deaths. There have been, you know, once again, the ongoing issue of uh, poor medical care. And Susan Hudson was seemingly the right candidate at the right time. Everyone always sort of wondered when a very, you know, credible and well-financed candidate might step up and run against, you know, Gusman, given the baggage, a sheriff who was removed from running his own jail. Now, Another thing that is, I guess, a kind of a positive for Marlon Gusman is that, you know, during the course um, of his tenure, going all the way back to 2004, that jail population has decreased mm -hmm. dramatically from more than 7,000 at the time of Katrina hit to just over 1,000 right now. So the progressive m movement, if you want to call it that, uh, has been in play for quite some time, which is not holding people on really high bail on nonviolent crimes, obviously less police attention to um, you know, minor drug offenses. Marijuana is essentially decriminalized here in, in New Orleans, simple possession. People rarely get taken to jail, and so that has decreased the jail population. But it gave an opening for Susan Hudson's, you know, I guess sort of the biggest issue was that phase three um, was, you know, money that had been uh, promised by FEMA going all the way back, you know, <clears throat> to Hurricane Katrina um, to build a separate standalone mental health facility. Now, Susan Hudson doesn't disagree with that concept, but she thinks that the city can save money by retrofitting the existing Orleans Justice Center, the relatively new high-rise that is now largely vacant um, it was built for, I think, 1,700 inmates, and the numbers fluctuated between 1,000 and 1,200. So there's a, a lot of empty space there that she believes can be retrofitted. Now, I will say, when it comes to, once again, people can slap kind of a simplistic label of, of progressive, but there were a lot of groups at the grassroots level, as Clancy pointed out, that Susan Hudson has been in touch with throughout her tenure as an independent police monitor. And... Uh, I guess, the, you know, the one thing that really worked in her favor were certain groups that were highly motivated. And I saw maybe more enthusiasm and motivation from, you know, voice of the experienced and, you know, some, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> you know, the first 72 reentry program for released inmates, uh, groups that really command quite a following at the grassroots level. The enthusiasm was not matched from what I saw in the Gusman camp, which was, you know, he had been sheriff again for, for quite some time, um, you know, the better part of 16 years. And like I said, came with that baggage, but just didn't have anything sort of fresh and new, except he was determined to continue with phase three. And one thing that Susan Hudson is going to confront is an order from the federal judge overseeing the consent decree uh, that that phase three get built. And she wants to wriggle out of that ruling by the federal judge. So that's going to be quite a challenge. And then the, the policies that Clancy mentioned, such as, 
either eliminating or reducing the cost of prison phone calls, um, that's almost more sort of universally just humanitarian relief for the poorest and most disadvantaged in our community. Uh, I think that was an, you know, uh, the kind of policy that just seemed fresh and new and different. And the one thing that this election did tell us is that, you know, the status quo is, is at risk. We saw it in some previous elections for, say, the judges at criminal court. Um, some judges in very good standing, some veteran judges in very good standing were shown the door by the electorate simply because uh, they'd been around, they represent the, I guess, sort of the old way of doing things, and people decided they want something, you know, fresh new approach, and Susan Hudson's going to represent that in a pretty big way. That's a citywide office that, you know, is, is often considered one of the most powerful positions in New Orleans. All right. So we'll be seeing it come January, right? Is she sworn no, in no, January? It's, no, five, you get a five-month delay. There's a five-month oh, delay. So Five-month delay, okay. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see the, the transition because a lot can happen <laughs> regarding okay. progress on that phase three. And then the other big yeah. thing that she, she campaigned on is getting rid of the health care provider for the jail, one of the city's biggest contracts in all of city government. Okay. Just to be clear, it's not a delay. It's built into state law. That's right. The sheriff right. takes office on the first, so, first Monday in May after the election, okay, which right. in this case is May 2nd. That's correct. So we have a while in the transition. Okay, thanks a lot, guys. Let's move over to Don now. It is holiday time. How are sales going? Well, sales, it, it, you won't have clear-cut numbers until the end of January. Retailers hold off on reporting their, their numbers till the end of January so that holiday returns don't factor into a weird report for January, and they're lumped in then together with the holiday sales. But all indications are, both locally and nationwide, that 2021 is a far, far better holiday shop shopping season than 2020 was. Um, it kicked off earlier. There are longer hours. There are more people out and about. If you remember at this time last year, there weren't extended hours. There were limited numbers of people who could be in stores. You had to wait in line six feet apart with your mask on to be able to go in anywhere or have a reservation to shop. Uh, so a lot of people resorted to online shopping last year, and that's a trend that uh, local economics experts say is definitely sticking around. Um, even the older population that was maybe a little more hesitant to do their shopping online got the hang of it and is doing it more. But if you combine the online with the brick-and-mortar shopping, it looks like this year's on target to be a little bit more like 2019 was instead of 2020. The biggest difference for us here in New Orleans, we know nationwide people are dealing with supply chain issues and labor <laughs> issues That's a, and COVID. That's a problem everywhere. But the problems here are even greater because of IDA. So um, Clearview Shopping Center sustained some real damage. We knew there was a renovation and a whole repurposing of that mall underway. But in addition to that redevelopment, they ended up with massive Ida damage and in large part are shut down except for a few stores. Esplanade Mall, same thing. Massive amounts of Ida damage closed that facility. So you're really far more limited on where you can shop this year. Um, the, big, the big box re retailers have had some supply issues, but they have lots of people in the stores. Lakeside Shopping Center continues to be an anomaly, both locally and nationwide. The, the era of the shopping mall, most experts will tell you, is going away. People aren't going to go stroll the mall, and they're not going to shop. Well, go to Lakeside. Mm -hmm. and, and that is not the case here at all. Um, the stores have gotten higher end kind of year to year to year to year. They just opened a new wine bar in the mall this week. Um, they continue to just improve the product they're putting out there, and they also continue to improve with the numbers of people coming in. The other thing that's not really been impacted by um, by COVID this year or by some of the labor issues are the boutiques, the magazine mm -hmm. streets of our area. They are doing very well, and people are, by and large, getting back out there. They want to shop. They want to touch and feel things in this community, and, and they're shopping. So it's looking like it's going to be a far better year. Um, but th these experts I'm talking to say um, – Things are getting better, progressively better too. The cost of renting a ship to bring your shipping, 
shipping traffic in from wherever you're importing your goods from went down. It's dropped significantly recently, um, dropped by half. So getting your goods is going to be a little cheaper, a little easier. The ports are opening back up. We still do have a nationwide shortage of truckers mm -hmm. to get things from the ports to the stores, but all of it is starting to turn around. So as long as the, the new buzz of COVID cropping back up again doesn't get too bad, right. um, the retailers are, are on target to do very well. Okay, very good. Thanks a lot, Don. Let's go back over to Clancy for a quick recap of some other elections. In yeah, outside of the sheriff's race, which was a marquee election in this particular cycle, uh, clerk of criminal court, Austin Baton, who, like Marlon Gussman, you know, led by a significant margin in the primary, lost in the runoff. This was a bad year for the establishment and for incumbents. Going to Council District B, here's an example of that. Jay Banks, the uh, one-term incumbent, got clobbered uh, in the runoff by Leslie Harris. And interestingly, Banks, like Gusman, led in the primary, but he went down by 1,100 votes in the runoff, and Leslie Harris increased her vote take by 1,400 votes to get 57 percent of the vote. That was one of the more lopsided results uh, of the runoff election. Let's look at Council District C, because there was an interesting race there. Another lopsided result, no incumbent running, but Freddie King, who would probably be the closest to an incumbent because he had the support of virtually everybody in the political establishment, even forces who were opposing each other on other <clears throat> fronts, united behind Freddie King. And he got 57% uh, of the vote. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, he got 62% of the vote uh, after getting 44% to lead the primary. Over to Council District D, this is the opposite effect. This is the tightest race of the primary. On election night, there were 60 votes between them. It dropped slightly to 58 votes when they opened the machines and did a recount. But still, the result uh, is the same in, in the long run in terms of Eugene Green, who was, by and large, the establishment candidate. Troy Glover was another... A uh, candidate uh, who, who carried the progressive banner. There was a very crowded primary, 14 candidates in the primary, and uh, Glover only got, uh, I think, 12 percent of the vote in the primary. So he went from 12 percent to 49.8 percent, if you round that up by two hundredths of a point. And that's a phenomenal surge, and he came so close to winning that race. And had he won, had Glover won, it would have been a clean sweep in the runoffs for, uh, for the progressive ballot, if you will. And the same folks who were backing Leslie Harris and, more importantly, Susan Hudson, also had Troy Glover on their ballot. They mm -hmm. couldn't quite pull it off. Eugene Green is a, is a known quantity in the city, especially in that area of town, Council District D. He spent a lot of time on boards and commissions. He was the city's economic development director under Mayor Mark Morial. So he certainly had paid his dues, and I think that carried him over the top. All right, so we'll be seeing a largely new council yes, in Orleans Parish next year. Okay, thanks a lot, clients. Mike, let's go back on over to you. And uh, we heard this week of uh, an arrest of a former Jesuit priest. Um, why don't you tell us what's happening there? Well, yeah, this is a uh, story that I broke for WWL TV on Monday night involving, as you said, a former Jesuit priest. And more recently, the director of ARC GNO, and that's the organization that deals with the developmentally disabled, best known for employing the handicap to sort and sell recycled Mardi Gras beads. Uh, so pretty high profile, and he was in that position up until a raid of his Metairie house on Monday. Uh, the authorities, Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office, um, as the lead agency, had heard uh, that he had images of um, men in, uh, I guess, sexually compromised positions. When they raided the house, they found all kinds of, le of electronics and allegedly, um, once again, images of, of males who had been sexually uh, uh, assaulted. And he ended up initially arrested on five counts of video voyeurism, one count of sexual battery. The details on this just continued each day of the week to get worse and worse. A uh, very disturbing scenario, enough that the national organization, you know, SNAP, the Survivors Network, uh, people abused by priests, heard about it and uh, sent out a statement of concern. Uh, obviously, when you have a priest involved, um, to 
just to point out that the charges so far do not involve any clients or people in his work at ARC, mm -hmm. and nor do they uh, involve anything, any known victims from his time as a priest. Uh, he was the pastor of uh, Immaculate Conception, that very venerable church right down in the middle of the CBD on Barone, um, from 2008 to 2012. However, authorities after this raid have confiscated what they describe as tens of thousands of images that they need to go through and he was caught in a rather unusual way among the things that they said they found, this came out in the, his bail hearing Thursday, were pictures of driver's licenses and other ID of the victims so that they were able to identify them and interview these men who were basically did not give consent and in fact were passed out when sexual liberties were taken allegedly by Stephen Sauer, who's now uh, still locked up. Additional counts were added just today for the knockout drugs and syringes and other paraphernalia that were found at his house. So the situation continues to go, you know, from bad to worse. Uh, just a, a, a nightmare scenario involving all of those issues that sadly, you know, we've heard over and over involving and the priests and, you know, now they're looking at uh, back into his history, the additional tens of thousands of images and to see, you know, if he had in fact been flagged for abuse and then shuffled off you know, to some other job but, or diocese. But he did leave the priesthood in, in what year, 2020? Well, he left right? in 2020. Okay. Uh, the Jesuits said he left voluntarily, but that again raises the red flag right. of the timing of his departure in 2020. Okay, we'll be finding out more about this. All righty, guys, time for other stories. Let's start with you, E. Yeah, you got another new hotel opening uh, <clears throat> early next month, opened by Hilton downtown. It's called the Canopy. It's in the former oil and gas building. It's going to be an 11-story hotel on Tulane Avenue. What's curious about it is that the spot where it exists, there was a very small Chinatown in New Orleans. This is where the Chinatown used to be. Okay. So they have a little bit of a Chinese motif, uh, including a restaurant that's going to save, it's going to serve clay pot, dirty rice. All righty. Don, over to you. It's this, in the spirit of giving not just retail but donations, Kids Join the Fight, which is a pediatric cancer organization started by one of our own, Walker Beery, um, with the goal of raising a million dollars in its first year, okay. has almost raised a million in its first six months. There's still good. a little bit of time to give to Kids Join the Fight. All right. Clancy, real quick to you. The new bio district uh, is preparing to come online, but they need to overcome some uh, concerns expressed by their neighbors in Mid-City and Gertown, and I think once they do that, the City Council will pr approve a cooperative endeavor agreement, but there are concerns in the neighborhood about the powers of this uh, state-created entity. No kiddo. Mike. Yeah, we know it's already been a, a, a bad year for all the local sports teams, and the Pelicans especially, because their star player, Zion Williamson, out with the broken foot, and we heard yet more bad news about Zion. Uh, he suffered a setback. They now give a timetable of four to six weeks before he can even begin working out. Some insiders are saying he doesn't step foot on the court again this season. Disappointment. All right, guys, thank you so much for being here. Thank you all for watching. See you again next week for Informed Sources. Have a good evening.